day's event includes a reception, which you've uh, enjoyed, but also a short program honoring uh, Mim Pugh and Dr. Mozak. And I'm going to give the mic right now to the director of our student association, Lori Thibodeau. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our afternoon reception to honor Mim Pugh. My name is Lori Thibodeau. I am the Student Association Chair here at Adler Graduate School. Um, when the Student Association began planning this event several months ago, it was an exciting opportunity. It was possibly the first opportunity for some of our students to see and hear Dr. Harold Mozak. It was an opportunity to honor Adler Graduate School's beloved Mim Pugh. But it has turned out to be so much more. Opportunity brought us all together today. Faculty, staff, alumni, students, community, and honored guests. In the best Adlerian tradition, we are bringing everyone together. It's amazing what can happen when an opportunity presents itself. Today, we have the privilege to honor an incredible woman, Mim Pugh. Our first speaker to commence today's reception, Dr. Harold Mozak, is one of the founders of the Adler School of Professional Psychology in Chicago. In turn, Dr. Mozak and the Adler School of Professional Psychology helped to found and develop what is now the Adler Graduate School. In fact, Dr. Mozak was the Adler Graduate School's most visible instructor for many years during the 1980s and 1990s. Indeed, he is a longtime friend of the Adler Graduate School and an even longer time friend of Mim Pugh. His reputation as an Adleri, Adlerian scholar precedes him, but his dedication and devotion to friends is also extraordinary. Just as Dr. Mozak has contributed his thoughts to all of us today, he has some words for Mim. Would you please welcome Dr. Harold Mozak? Thank you. I've known Mim, as I told her, longer than anybody in this room. Mm -hmm. I think I first met her the week after she came to Minnesota with her husband Bill and came down to visit Dr. Drakers in Chicago and Dr. Drakers brought the pews to my home. And what year was that? That you came to Minnesota? <coughs> not sure. It's a long time. There's an expression, to know someone is to love them. And I think that's especially true of my relationship with Mim. Over the years, every time I came, I had dinner with Mim and her late husband. I would not dare come here and not see them. She's trusted me to be a co-counselor with her on a case or two that she was seeing while I happened to be in town. I used to be in town maybe six times a year for a weekend, so it is not like today. I haven't traveled for a year. This is the only exception I've made to travel because I wanted to honor men. And I think of Mim in the same way I answered a question earlier. Uh, somebody asked me a question, I think he was sitting right there. And I said to him, you got a week? And I feel the same way about talking about Mim. Uh, I don't know how to put it into one, two, or three sentences. But something did occur to me which may summarize my feelings of love and respect for Mim. And that is, I said earlier, I may be the only 
Hitlerian in the world who doesn't know what social interest is because there are hundreds of definitions of what it is. But if there is such a thing as social interest and you want to know what it is, take a look at Mimpu. Thank you. Thank you. Whoever you are, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting over and over announcing your place in the family of things. These lines are from the poem Wild Geese by Mary Oliver and appear as part of Ruth Katz's Adler Graduate School bio. In this bio, she goes on to say, Adlerian psychology called to me like the wild geese from the time I met Bill Pugh in 1971. I had just begun teaching at an alternative school for high school dropouts when Bill introduced me to Rudolf Dreicher's writings and the concepts of natural and logical consequences. Eventually my teaching and learning led me to a degree in special education and then to the Adler Institute in 1985. It was there I learned how to find our place in the family of things and how our private logic contributes to the way we define ourselves in the family. When Ruth was invited to become a didactic instructor at the Adler Graduate School, she discovered a new role in this Adlerian family, where she has been serving students for the past two decades. It is in the context of her Adlerian family that she has developed a deep and loving personal and professional relationship with Mim. Everyone, Please welcome Ruth Katz. When I met with Mim uh, the other night, um, I was asked, I was saying to her, "I need to. I've been invited to speak some words about her." And we were sitting at dinner, and I just said, um, and Mim was saying, "Well, what do you mean? What do you what are you talking about? Talk about?" I said, "Mim, we're going to be honoring you on Friday." And she says, "Oh, well." don't make a big deal about this. And I said, I said, well, I'm not going to make a big deal about it. It's just that that's how Mim is, is that what Mim is, um, somebody who, who doesn't, want, doesn't want to be put as, as somebody special, and yet Mim is somebody special. Um, I met Mim uh, back in uh, 1971 when I was doing some work with Bill Pugh, just met her briefly, and then Bill invited me to come to a family education demonstration at the Guthrie Theater. And in those days they filled the Guthrie to cut parents and families, filled the place to see Mim and, and, and Bill on stage working with a family. And Bill was out there in the front. Um, and directing things, and Mim was standing in the back, and there was a little boy in the family who was acting out like crazy, and then Mim just kind of stepped in very gently and said a few words to him, like, could it be this or could it be that? And he started nodding his head, and then he settled down, and I thought that's how Mim works. She just steps in, asks a few questions, and everybody settles down. Um, I wanted to share just a little bit of history that not, perhaps people don't know about Mim. That, um, when, that the way she discovered Adlerian psychology, she was uh, raising five children out in Oregon. Bill was a full-time pediatrician. And Mim's 13-year-old daughter was suddenly beautiful and attracting many boys, even college boys. And she said, I know how to raise children, but this is really something different. And um, she had heard about, through a friend, I think it was, about the, somebody named Rudolf Dreikers was going to be doing a talk at the, at the university. And so she went over to see what's this all about because he's going to be talking about children. And um, she walked in and she said, there was Rudolf Dreikers sitting on a desk looking like Humpty Dumpty, sw swinging his legs, and in this booming voice talking about raising children. And she said that was it. It changed her life. She came home, she talked to Bill, and she said, I was totally intrigued. I decided to go back. I came home and told Bill, my husband, pediatrician, who was also an expert, and he said he had to come too and see what was going on. So on that following Saturday, Mim and Bill went over to see Rudolf Dreikers do another family demonstration. 
and 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 from there grew this long and endearing and loving friendship um, among the pews and the Drakers. Um, Mim had no formal college education at that point, but she wanted to take a class from Ray Lowe, who was a professor there and an Adlerian. And uh, so she wanted to learn more. She said, I wanted to learn more about how to raise children. So she went and spoke to Ray, and he said, you have to take the class, but you have to take it for credit. And she was absolutely terrified because she said, I can't go to college. But she did. And this is, I think, a spirit of Mim that she's brought to her students as well, that yes, you can do it. Don't get scared, just go do it. And which is very leering, just go do it. And she did. And from there, her career grew, and she got a degree. They, the Pews moved back here to Minnesota. Mim got her MSW, and the rest is history. Um, Mim, in, in talking with Mim, one of the things that she helped me so much was to help me to identify my private logic. You know, she, um, to help me feel encouraged, um, the first time I saw her as a didactic student, she, I walked in, I was just terrified. And I thought, what is she going to find out about me? <laughs> and I sat down, and <laughs> that's what I was afraid of. And I sat down, and we started talking, and, and I said, I'm just really scared. And she said, of what? And I said, well, I'm afraid you're going to think I'm crazy. And she just laughed, and she said, well, what if I do? You know? <laughs> and <laughs> so I, I hadn't thought of it that way. So um, there became um, the beginning of my exploring didactic. And she, um, um, then I had a chance to work with her doing psychodrama, and um, <laughs> then I got a chance to work with her in her practice. But Mim, one of the things that you did for me was help me identify some of my private logic. And so, if I may, these are all Adlerians, and we're used to doing demonstrations. I would like to perhaps share some, what I think is are parts of your private logic. <laughs> <laughs> So um, these are just I just I just went up to there are only twelve of them there, I'm sure I'm sure there's more so anyway um, one of them is and I'm just taking a guess and could it be correct me if I'm wrong okay when I get scared I get my courage to looking at how I can do it better I don't expect and don't want to be singled out as special or accomplished I just want to help people to learn how to change. Adlerian psychology teaches us how to live. It is a way of life. It's practical. When we raise children in the spirit of cooperation and social interest, they grow up being cooperative and living socially interested lives. I really like to work in a team. It's just so interesting. Being now, <laughs> this is the thing that Mim and I talked about. Mim said, sometimes I get emotional, which of course I know she does. And so if I look at her and I start to get tears, it's because we do this with each other. So I did borrow a piece of Kleenex. Thank you. Being open, non judgmental, and eager and curious to learn about one's clients contributes positively to the therapy. Create a place of sanctuary with your clients. Not giving the answers, but exploring the possibilities of answers tends to work better for the clients and the therapist. Having a sense of humor comes in handy. The four goals of misbehavior, attention getting, power struggle, re revenge, and hopelessness are really helpful when you're trying to figure out what is going on with kids. To work with clients, we need to fall in love with them. We need to truly love who they are. And when in doubt, be generous. Nice. So where is Mim today? Mim is in retirement. She's still Mim. She's still living her life as an Adlerian. With her family, her children are adult children of Adlerians. That's what they call themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and they're practicing the Adlerian principles. As Mim says, now they are the leaders. Now they are caring for me as I so cared for them. With the school, as Mim said, when she, is, when she thinks about and talks about the Adler Graduate School, she always stops and then says, Drakers would be so proud. So proud of the students, so proud of the faculty, so proud of the founders, the administration, the therapists, the staff, everybody who has so contributed to make this place happen. With the Counseling Center, she has a dream, and the dream is that it will be a place where the practical application of Illyrian principles will occur, a place for family education, 
and demonstration that will intrigue, and these are Mim's words, she wants to intrigue people, intrigue parents to learn more, to think in a different way. So in summary, I want to leave you with Mim's words. She says, often, I do my work because I love to do it. If we cooperate and work to get along, that is all I expect. I have enjoyed and will continue to enjoy working with people and being helpful. And this work has always been a privilege and an honor for me to do. I feel so fortunate to have found it. And I feel so fortunate to have found Mim. Thank you. introduce our final speaker, I have an important announcement to make. Please take an opportunity to donate to our holiday food drive between now and the holiday break. All donations will go to volunteers enlisted to assist people along with a $400 gift from the school. You can find donation boxes in the Adler Graduate School lobby and I think there's some boxes down here also. Our final speaker for today's reception is Dan Haugen. Dan is trained in social work and has served nonprofit organizations in higher education since 1978, including 22 years with the Neighborhood Involvement Program, 17 as president and executive director, and 23 years with the Adler Graduate School, 11 as academic vice president, and since May of this year, president. <laughs> I had the privilege of sitting with Dan yesterday to discuss some of the details of today's event. He asked me if I had ever met Mim, and sadly I had not. He went on about Mim describing this picture for me of goodness, someone who nourishes the soul, a person who is genuine to her core. Thank you, Dan, for a beautiful picture of the person we honor here today. Would you please join me in welcoming Dan Haugen to the podium. Thank you, Lori. And I also want to say thank you to the Adler Graduate School Student Association for sponsoring this wonderful event. It's not often that we have the chance to host Dr. Mozak, and in my memory, we've never held an event that prominently featured both Mim Pugh and Dr. Mozak. What a blessing. A blessing for our students and alumni, for our friends and community partners, for our staff and faculty, and for our board of directors in the school in general. Thanks once again to Lori Thibodeau and the Student Association and to all the members of our staff who helped to facilitate this event. None of these things happen by accident, and together you have crafted and executed an event that we can truly be proud of, and most importantly, an event that truly honors two wonderful people. And it is in the spirit of honoring two wonderful people that I stand before you now. Most of you know that the Adler Graduate School, including representatives from all of our constituent groups, students, alumni, faculty, staff, community partners, board members, and administrators are in the process of developing the Jim Ramstead Community Service Center. The Ramstead Center will complement our educational programs, providing meaningful training and volunteer opportunities for our students and alumni, and vital human services for community members in need. So just as we are expanding our educational programs, we are also extending our reach in the community. We at the Adler Graduate School aspire to an educational and service environment where people can variously train and serve or be served with great dignity. This is why the expansion of the school's educational programs and our development of the Ramstead Center are so exciting. Now the Ramstead Center will include two primary components. The eggs operated family center and a group of carefully chosen nonprofit tenants whose missions are in keeping with that of the school. Now, I'm happy to report that our development of the Ramstead Center is progressing rapidly. In fact, the Adler Graduate School Operated Family Center now includes an active school counseling service center 
and an art therapy service center. In addition, this winter, a planning team will lay the groundwork for a third component, a counseling and family education center. And this spring, a very well-known and reputable 40-year-old nonprofit by the name of Human Services Incorporated, HSI, will join us as an anchor tenant and cornerstone of the Adler Graduate School's Jim Ramstead Community Service Center. In fact, HSI will occupy this space and uh, make great use of 11,000 square feet. We're also entertaining inquiries from other prospective nonprofit tenants, so if you have somebody that you're in contact with that might have an interest in some additional space that we have here, contact us. But back to the Family Center component. The Family Center component of the Ramstead Center. The component of the Ramstead Center that the school will operate directly. Today I have two announcements. They have to do with the naming of the Family Center and one of its components. More specifically, they have to do with Harold and Mim and the Adler Graduate School's desire to honor them. And who better to honor? Mim Pugh was a founder of the organization that gave birth to the Adler Graduate School. And Dr. Mozak is a founder of not only the Adler School of Professional Psychology in Chicago, but can also be considered one of the founders of our own organization's capacity for graduate education. And it's in this spirit that I would like to read two proclamations unanimously approved by our Board of Directors at its November 2011 meeting. Mim and Harold and Ada, would you please come forward? Now I ask Ada to come forward. I ask Ada to come forward because as we know, behind every great man is a great woman. I'm going to read these proclamations one by one and give each of these two an opportunity to individually comment. The first, the first naming proclamation concerns Dr. Harold Mozak, and it goes like this. The Adler Graduate School acknowledges Harold H. Mozak in grateful recognition of Harold Mozak's dedication to the Adler Graduate School and his many contributions to its birth and ongoing development, the Adler Graduate School's Board of Directors and the rich group of constituents it represents is honored to announce its plans for the development of the Harold H. Mozak Family Center on this date, December 9, 2011. Would you like to comment? <laughs> I'm running out of words and breath. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for this honor. Uh, I was informed that this was to honor Ben Pugh, and naturally, it's a surprise to me that you thought of honoring me too. I cherish Minnesota. I founded this school quite as an accident. And we had no students, no money, <laughs> no nothing. <laughs> but we had three or four doers, one of whom you see on the stage with me at the time. And we made this a viable school. I wish I had a 90 years more to come back and teach you, and I thank you again. Thank you. The second naming proclamation concerns Miriam Pugh Ferguson. And it goes something like this. 
The Adler Graduate School acknowledges Miriam L. Pugh Ferguson. In grateful recognition of Miriam Pugh Ferguson's dedication to the Adler Graduate School and her many contributions to, the, to its birth and ongoing development, the Adler Graduate School's Board of Directors and the rich group of constituents it represents is honored to announce its plans for the development of the Miriam L. Pugh Ferguson Counseling and Family Education Center. <laughs> I'm noted for crying when I get emotional. This is just uh, unbelievable. Uh, it takes me back to when I first met Rudolf Dreikers. I was raising five kids, little kids, and um, he was teaching at the University of Oregon. And he would come to the house for dinner and the kids, of course, would be kids. And um, <laughs> and one time, uh, my daughter accidentally, one of my daughters accidentally bumped his glasses and put, put knocked the little piece of glass out. Uh -huh. And she went up to him and uh, said she was so sorry. She was like about 10. And he told me afterwards, I was so impressed that you didn't tell her what to do. You just let her take care of it herself. So just being with them was always learning something, learning lessons. And the little, the little kids, my sons were the youngest, and they were uh, preschoolers when draggers came into our life. And uh, one of my sons was at my house today, and uh, he remembers and I remember that when draggers came, the boys would be out playing in the driveway, and they'd say, here comes God again. <laughs> and needless to say, they would be a little bit jealous of the, of the attention that Drikers and T got when they came to our house. Um, but I have many wonderful memories of those days. Um, Drikers, as you know, we used to play personalities on the piano. And um, many times at our house, when we had a meeting of professionals, we'd end by Dreikers playing personalities on the piano. And one time he played uh, a beautiful song, and uh, at the top he had a lot of the treble clef, a lot of little, diddle, 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 and people were guessing who it was. No, it's not them. That's not them. And then finally he said, it's meme. He called me meme. And he, Did, didn't you hear the laughter up here? That's me, he said. <laughs> and so we had many wonderful, wonderful times with them. And, and then I can remember going to Chicago and meeting you and, and Bernie. And, and I was uneducated. I felt like, oh my gosh, these people are so smart. And <laughs> junior guys. Yes, junior guys. very much so. And I had a few, like a thousand inferiority <laughs> but um, but I gradually got educated and joined and joined the gang. But Adlerian psychology has been so big in my life since um, since I was in my early 30s, raising these five children, and uh, it's never stopped being big in my life. And all of you are so fortunate to have it be in your lives because. It's so effective with human relationships and relationships with your kids and your families. And I live in a duplex now, fortunately, since my husband just died last week. Um, my daughter and her husband are upstairs and um, she's a, an artist. So she came down and told me what to wear uh, because she knows, <laughs> of course. And I always trust her advice. <laughs> or sometimes I call her and say, do you think I ought to wear this or this? Oh, Mom, I'll be right down and I'll show you. <laughs> so I have these wonderful cooperative children. Uh, my youngest, who is a son, 
has been there every day since Dale died, just to help out and just to be present. And uh, so I, I feel so fortunate to have such thoughtful, loving, wonderful family and, and people like Harold in my life that I know I can always call if I, if I want to and always have been able to, just like I could call Drikers and, um, and, or we could call Drikers. Bill and I used to have fights over the telephone with Drikers. <laughs> 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 would help us straighten us out. <laughs> so, so Adlerian psychology has been a wonderful, wonderful uh, part of my life ever since I've been in my 30s. So that's 50 years now. Um, so I'm so happy for all of you that you have a chance to learn this wonderful way of life and practice it with your friends and families and, and children because it's so, and as I look over, I, I remember you have little kids and um, how wonderful to raise them with the, with the Adlerian ideas. So uh, it's, a wonderful, it's wonderful to be here with all of you and thank you very much for the honor. I feel extremely humbled. As they make their way back to their seats, I just want to thank everyone again, everyone in attendance. I want to thank those who've sponsored uh, and crafted and are hosting this event. And to Harold and Mim, uh, thank you for your many, many contributions to the school. Uh, enjoy the rest of the reception. Dr. Mozak is going to resume his presentation. You want to do that now? Yeah. What? Excuse me. Oh. Excuse me. Um, Wendy. Uh, We'll make a, an introduction if you want to resume now. Yeah. Okay. I'll let her make the introduction, then I'll get the mic uh, all soon set up again. I'll keep, I'll keep it short, Harold. <laughs> um, hi. Um, I'm a student here still. <laughs> um, I first met Harold Mozak when he came to Adler Graduate School to speak two years ago. Like a homing pigeon, Harold returns to his roots of teaching and caring about the development of Adler of Minnesota. We are all grateful for his tutelage and his guidance in Adlerian theory. Harold significantly affected the change of Adler's three tasks of life into five tasks of life. In On Purpose, Dr. Mozak writes about work, society, and sex as the basis for Adler's three tasks of life. Mozak and Bernard uh, Schulman developed the fourth and fifth tasks of life with spirituality and self. The topic for tonight's lecture uh, is faith, hope, and love. We are privileged to have... Oh, and psychotherapy. Okay. Well, that's very important. It's integral, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Um, we are privileged to have Harold Mozak present his view of these very important topics in all our lives. Now, I'm going to quote from uh, On Purpose. Love for Adler exists as a component of man's social feeling. <laughs> modern age. Um, <clears throat> in this way, Adler elevates love to the rank of its, his highest value for mankind, social interest. Mozak continues with stating that Adler's assignment of centrality to love and cooperation as giving meaning to life. I am looking forward to hearing our Adlerian friend, supporter, and teacher extraordinaire speak on faith and hope and love and psychotherapy. Thank you.
lost the first page, Ada. <laughs> Okay, um, first of all, as I said earlier today, I'm not a prophet, certainly not a biblical type prophet. I'm not a theologian either. And I do not propose to do what other people have done when they've discussed a topic with a similar title. Their aim has been to reconcile uh, Adlerian psychology or psychotherapy with various religious principles, and usually it is the Catholic, the Catholic members, uh, the most recent one being a Catholic priest, I believe even he's from this area, who wrote Faith, Hope, and Love in Psychotherapy and tries to reconcile them. I'm not going to do that except that I may give you a biblical example or something like that. My topic is entirely secular. Now, <clears throat> St. Paul in 1 Corinthians writes, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, St. Paul was an observant Jew before his sudden conversion on the road to Damascus, but he must have known, being an Orthodox Jew, the Hebrew equivalents as Emunah, Tikva, and Ahava. In 1974, I wrote on this topic about two sentences worth. It appears in Corsini's Current Psychotherapies, Volume 1. And I indicated that the necessary but not sufficient conditions in psychotherapy are faith, hope, and love. But Corsini only permitted us, I don't know, 25 pages or something like that. And I didn't, and we had a right to his outline all the contributors. So I didn't have an opportunity to expand on the topics. And today you are the first people to hear some of my later thoughts, not 1974 thoughts, on faith, hope, and love in psychotherapy. First of all, <clears throat> the role of faith. When psychologists and religionists talk about faith, they use terms like transcendence and invisible and supernatural and other terms which are congenial to religion and philosophy. They'll not be used here. Operationally, to have faith in somebody or something centers on the ability to count on someone or something, no more than that. So, if people have faith in God, they're expressing the notion that they can count on God for whatever it is they count on God for. Some people count on God for love. And children who are very, very young are taught God is love. Some place their faith in justice, and greatness, and you have the Muslim call Allah Akbar, God is great. Some have faith in grace, and in our culture, amazing grace, 
and they count on this as something that they can believe in and it is generally static as far as they're concerned. So one may have faith in other character traits such as loyalty and honesty in our country. For example, Stephen Decatur's My Country, Right or Wrong, But My Country. They can have <coughs> faith in character traits such as loyalty and honesty. And <coughs> by your being here, you show some faith in Adlerian psychology. You can count on it, you feel. So, if you describe subscribe to the basic assumptions of holism, teleology, phenomenology, field theory, the uniqueness of the individual and the unity of personality, you are expressing faith. Now therapists of various persuasions or orientations forward many explanations of why their therapy works or works better than other therapies. There are literally hundreds of therapies. Some therapists allege that the superiority of their therapy, their theory has given them therapy, their therapy, the edge. So you find that uh, Freudian psychology almost had a monopoly in teaching and in practice in the United States when I was learning psychotherapy and first practicing psychotherapy. There were no Adlerian schools. The only Adlerian, two Adlerians in <laughs> Chicago were Dr. Dreikers and Dr. Erwin Krauss. There was one Jungian and all the rest were Freudians. And then came my first therapy teacher, Carl Rogers at the University of Chicago. And he indicated sometimes verbally, usually not, that he had a therapy that does as good a job as the Freudians do and doesn't take 20 years five times a week to do it. <laughs> and giving the sustainability of Rogerian therapy, other schools gained prominence or were invented. And it was at about this time that Adlerian psychology became a movement, uh, an interest, a, not really a school until 1952. And uh, in some circles, a valid school. I say that because Freudian psychology was the only psychology, the only game in town that really worked. So I was teaching at a university and the chairman came up to me and said, how can you, a reputable psychologist, be working in a, pra in a practice run by quacks? And I worked in Denver at the VA for a while. And when I came back, one of the professors at the University of Chicago asked me what I was doing back in Chicago. And I said, I've come to work with Dr. Dreikers. Dreikers? What is that man going to learn some psychology? <laughs> so the times were quite different than they are right now. And it took a good bit of, I'm going to use that word again, doing to, as Dreikers said, put us on the map. In fact, I had one terrible encounter. I was one of four people speaking on some topic in therapy, and the other three people were from other orientations, one of them a Freudian. And when the chairman of the program introduced me and announced that I was an Adlerian, this Freudian psychiatrist walked off the stage. Oh. 
you wouldn't caught, be caught dead on the same stage oh as, as an Adlerian. So, at any rate, we had faith. The three of us decided that we were going to spread the Adlerian gospel, and we decided, with no funds, no quarters, and teaching for free, that we were going to start an Adlerian school. And today we have a thousand students, and some of you have seen our magnificent quarters. And we graduate 125 or so people every graduation. And Drakers would be happy to know we're on the map. Because he wasn't sure we'd ever be there. Because after we had started the school and had taught for years, and. Uh, had just a small group of students and that kind of thing. Drakers asked the question that I was confronted with earlier today. Where do you think at Lurian Psychology in our school is going? And uh, he gave his view, and Shulman gave his view, and I said, I hope someday to see this school as a degree giving doctoral degree giving stu uh, school fully accredited by our accrediting, regional accrediting body. And Drikers laughed and said, in our time? And I said, Dr. Drikers, perhaps not in your time, <laughs> but I think in our time. Shulman's response was more pointed. He said, Hal, what kind of hemp do you smoke? <laughs> But apparently I smoke good hemp <laughs> because we are viable and we are successful. And people flock to our school. So we had faith then and we have faith now. And Lurian psychology is something we can count on. Now, People who have faith in their theory, when you read what they say, they are the best theories, etc., because they are not superficial, a term always used in earlier textbooks uh, with respect to Hitlerian psychology, because they were not deep, intensive, uh, long-term therapies which uh, cured everything, but the others were repressive, inspirational, as I said, superficial, supportive, and all kinds of things like that. And we didn't get very much of a hearing. And if you're interested, Norman Ros the late Norman Rosenthal and Ray, late Ray Corsini wrote an article in our journal. They went through all the textbooks available at that time to see what kinds of things were said about Freudian psychology and what kinds of things were said about Adlerian psychology. From the point of view of the literature, it was no contest. Freudian was everything, and Adlerian, well, it was quackery. Now, some do not rely on theory, but there is still evidence, strong evidence, that some people feel that they have faith because it is deepest, it's most intensive, and all of that kind of thing. In fact, one French psychiatrist world known has come up with exciting theories and people have flocked as they used to flock to Vienna to Freud they flocked to Paris now to hear Jacques Lacan and Jacques Lacan wrote you know sometimes my theories are so complex even I don't understand them <laughs> and that really fits the definition of a deep therapy so Another group of people felt 
that their success, or lack of success as the case may be, was the personality of the therapist. A therapist ought to be this, 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 and this. And you find studies done on what kind of personality is best suited to do psychotherapy. I don't know that that really works because I've seen psychotic therapists <laughs> do excellent psychotherapy. And in terms of personality characteristics, I really am not sure what kind of personality the people that I work with are all quite different. Uh, they think differently, they do differently than I do, and we respect each other, but we're not the same personality. So, you find articles by my late friend James Pugentall on the therapist has to be authentic, and perhaps he does, but that is not a sufficient condition for therapy to work. Carl Rogers said the therapist had to be warm and acceptant of others and that kind of thing, and I agree with that too. I have great respect for my teachers who are not Hitlerian too. They did teach me all kinds of things, including what not to do. And uh, it's nice to be warm and accepting, but I've seen therapists who do successfully who are brutes. <laughs> They're not warm and they're not accepting. Drikers was known to, when he didn't like something that the patient was saying, to pull at the remaining tufts of his hair and say, ach, such stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> and having been the butt of that kind of approach myself, it didn't work well with me. It didn't work well with patients. But Dreikers was a very, very successful therapist. And being an extremist, he could be the most gentle of therapists, as well as this tough, ranting psychiatrist that he sometimes was. So still others felt that the change agent resided in the therapist-patient relationship, so they began to study what goes on between patient and therapist. And the Freudians were first at this. They discussed the transference. Of course, they didn't know about transference any more than I know about social interest. But they knew that the transference had to be manipulated. In fact, just as a small aside, I said today uh, that I was, uh, since 1956, a specialist. And the only thing I became a specialist at, due to this group, was the ability and opportunity to question in a three-hour oral exam uh, people who wanted to be specialists. Then there is a phenomenon in Chicago known as the Mozak reflex. I don't know that they teach it in any school, but it's well known. They didn't ever have enough, there were teams of three doing the examinations, and they never had enough Freudians to test all the people who were taking the exam in Freudian psych psychoanalysis. But since I had taught Freudian psychology at the university, they decided, even though I was nominally an Adlerian, I'd do for examination purposes. So I would ask them, I could only examine them in Freudian psychology. You had to examine the person in the psychology practice. So I would ask, in this interview that you've submitted, they had to send in a typescript. Uh, what are you attempting to do? 
And many times, I got the answer to manage the transference. So I played naive and I said, I'm not a Freudian, so I don't know about transference and this, that kind of stuff. So why don't you point out in the interview where you manage the transference so I'll know how to examine you. Not once in the years and years that I examined people could a Freudian come up with the definition of transference and how it operated. The only people who knew about transference never bothered to mention it. They talked about other things that went on in the interview, but they never once said, I tried to manage the transference. So we know easily whom to fail. You see, the mosaic reflex goes in to effect. I ask, so show me where the transference is. And now they remain silent because they really don't understand. They use platitudes. So Adlerians are not the only ones who are guilty of platitudinous thinking, you see. But the transference was one of the kinds of relationship. The TA people talked about the games that people play and discussed other kinds of relationships. In fact, uh, one TA person wrote a book called Games Therapists Play and discusses what goes on back and forth between patient and therapist. And while TA people have their successes, it's not based on the relationship either. So, since everybody has his shares of successes and failures, some more of one than of the other, there must be some other ingredients in, that make uh, therapy valuable. And these ingredients are faith, love, and hope. Now, the factor, one factor, of course, is faith. And you hear statements of faith over and over and over again, or statements of non-faith, usually in the initial interview, but it, as I said, a relationship is a process, and it can occur anywhere in therapy. But a patient comes in and says, my doctor told me that CBT is the best. I got one this week, and the person asked me for the name of a CBT therapist. Others express faith in the therapist. You treated my neighbor who said you perform miracles. There are others who value or place faith in the therapist's education experience. They look at my diplomas and they say, see, I see you went to Chicago, great school. And if I have enough diplomas on my wall, even better. It is a faith enhancing thing. In fact, there's a New Yorker cartoon that shows a patient on the couch and the therapist's diplomas all on the ceiling, so <laughs> wouldn't miss any. <laughs> In terms of faith and fame and reputation, I came to see you after reading your article in, your chapter in some journal, some book, and it made sense, or nothing else has made sense. I gotta try something, so I'm trying you. Sometimes it is faith in the therapist's astrological sign. And here, I have trouble. I've lost several patients because I'm a Scorpio. I have one interview with them, and that is the end. They say, we're going to be incompatible. I'm a Libra or something. And they have or they don't have faith. And. They have faith in theory or methods. Everyone's talking about EMDR. 
So I got to try in the EMDR. And there are all kinds of things you can have faith in. Uh, Drakers and I always worked in multiple psychotherapy, so we were in the room together with the patient. And I was seeing a patient, a young woman, with a psychiatrist. Some of you may know her. She's dead now many years. Bina Rosenberg. And Bina and I were doing fine with this patient. And now came vacation time. So it was easy to transfer her to, the, to Dr. Rosenberg because Dr. Rosenberg sat in on all the interviews and knew everything that I knew about the patient. And there was no problem with the transfer. And I came back three weeks later and I sat down with Dr. Rosenberg and the patient to have the patient turn back to me. And the patient was very embarrassed and finally said, Dr. Mozak, would you really mind if I continued seeing Dr. Rosenberg rather than you? And I said, if that's your preference, it's okay, but would you tell me why? And she said, I've always thought of a therapist as a person who wore horn-rimmed glasses and spoke uh, uh, with a German accent. <laughs> well, I couldn't even put on a German accent if I tried. So we transferred and Dr. Rosenberg became her primary therapist. Now, faith does not have to have any evidence. And we know that, especially in religion. There are certain articles of faith that we have in any religion, and we believe this, that, or the other thing, as our own religion tells us to. But actually, characteristic and you don't have to have a certain kind of relationship and you can still have great successes now when I was very young uh, I don't mean chronologically in age as a therapist Drakers was invited to give a talk on Adlerian psychology at a hospital which was a psychoanalytic training institute and after he told them about Adlerian psychology he had a question and answer period and a Freudian psychiatrist said Dr. Drakers I would like to tell you something I just read and then I would like to have your comment as an Adlerian on what happened and the psychiatrist proceeded to tell what he had read it seems in, in South America somewhere, they had run short of unskilled industrial workers. So somebody came up with an idea. There are all of these Indian tribes around. We'll bring them to the big city and let them run the machines and everything. And we'll pay them a pittance after all, what do natives need? So they imported a tribe of Indians to the big city and put them to work. They taught them what they wanted to teach them of the operation. And uh, they had them start working in industry. A couple of weeks later, they discovered that every single member of the tribe working had become impotent. And of course, they wouldn't work. If this is what coming to the city and earning an industrial living entailed, they just do without. So this was kind of troublesome to employers. So they hired an analyst 
to come talk to these Indians and see maybe they could recover their potency and be good workers again. So the analyst utterly failed. And he admitted he failed. So they had to come up with another idea. So somebody said, let's get the tribal witch doctor here. Maybe he can do it. So the tribal witch doctor came, took him out in the field, lined him up in a circle, had him dance around in a circle, chanted a few chants, and very soon every person became potent. So my question, Dr. Drecker, he said is, why did the analysts fail and the witch doctor succeed? So Drinker said, well, I'm willing to share that with you, but first of all, I'd like to hear your interpretation. So he talked about castration fears and totemism and all kinds of psychoanalytic stuff, etc. And he finished and Drinker said, that's a very, very nice interpretation. You want to know mine? Well, of course, Dr. Drinkers. The medicine man was a better salesman. <laughs> And basically, one of the things that helps you become a better salesman is your faith in what you're selling and the patient's faith, faith enough to buy what you're selling. If your relationship will do it, it'll work. If your relationship won't do it, it won't work. If the methods you use do it, well, they'll buy it. And if they don't buy it, well, you got to think of something else. So it is important that faith, well, that therapy be a faith-enhancing experience. And we do that sometimes in terms of some theory, but we do it sometimes just in terms of just plain old practice. So, as I said, we hang up a zillion diplomas to impress the patient with. Uh, we may put our name forth in TV. Uh, we start a practice in a prestigious location. In fact, in Los Angeles, the street where most analysts practice is called Couch Canyon. <laughs> there are so many. There are so many Freudians practicing there. And it's impressive to many, to the patients who are impressed by it. And they buy what the therapist is selling. So you have to think of faith enhancing experience. But that is kind of difficult because it's not a matter of one size fits all. If you ran that kind of clothing store, you'd run out of customers quickly. So you have to come up with faith instilling measures that the patient will buy. And sometimes he helps you along by coming in with that kind of faith right at the beginning. I know you make miracles, etc., and you don't have to work so hard. Mm -hmm. But some other patients, you have to work very, very hard. You have to be a creative therapist to get them to accept anything you're buying. And those people are especially known as mandated patients. They don't want to be in therapy. They don't think they need therapy. But the court said, you better go for six months of therapy. Better than sitting in our county jail. So they come in for six months of therapy. Now, I was always troubled because they didn't want therapy. And if they didn't want therapy, I couldn't do anything about it. Because one of the most powerful lessons I ever got was from a psychiatrist supervisor of mine in 1950. I've remembered that all these years. He said, Harold, you can't make rabbit stew unless you got yourself a rabbit. 
And many times we don't even bother to grow ears on our patients who need the growing of ears. We start off with, give me this day, uh, date and that date and this symptom and that symptom, etc. And we forget that we may not have a patient here. We just have somebody who's occupying, occupying a chair, acting like a patient, but he's not a patient. And after doing six months and six months and six months with no success at all, I finally decided I better either quit seeing these people because legally I didn't have to see these people or I had to come up with a creative solution. So I finally come to one where I have patience. I get rabbits. I tell these people, I know you don't want therapy, but the court says you have to have it. But that's not my problem. I'm a busy therapist. I have to treat more patients than I have time to care for. And I don't like wasting my time just talking to somebody who isn't interested in what I'm selling. So, I don't have to, you legally have to be in therapy, but I don't have to legally treat you. I can reject you as a patient. So, I'm going to see you for three or four more interviews. If I see you becoming a patient, then I will continue your therapy. If you do not behave like a patient, I will just turn you back to the court and let the judge decide what to do about you, not me. You know what? Ears grow instantly. <laughs> And when my students come in and complain that we have a prison program in our school, that gee, they have all of these sexual offenders who don't care about therapy, and then, what do I do, Dr. Mozak? And they're still having the problems that I had in a long period of my career. And being a teacher, I at least tell them this one thing that they can do to cultivate patience. So, we do all kinds of things to inspire faith, and if we don't do it, we aren't going to have patience or working patience. But all of these things I just mentioned, diplomas and horn rim <coughs> classes and a German accent, are all externals. Existing concurrently with this faith in externals, at least in Adlerian therapy, patients have a lifelong faith in their lifestyles. It is something they earnestly believe in. They are articles of faith. Now, objectively, these things they believe may not be true or may not be working, but they believe them as if they are true, and they worked up until they didn't work this time. And because the patient has this intense faith in his lifestyle, it's difficult to get him to drop or modify the things that he's had faith in all of his life. If I were asked, if I were to ask you now to change your faith in your uh, native religion, etc., I don't think anybody would easily do it. I'm not sure anybody would do it easily or not. Because the things you have faith in, you count upon. And consequently, these people count upon themselves <coughs> that if they live their lifestyles, they will have security. What they believe will work. So. They believe, and it's probably true, that the goal of any lifestyle has three sub-goals. The first goal of the lifestyle is to understand life. That's important. Simple things are major things. 
So, if you know that red light means stop, and you count on it, then whenever you see a red light, you'll stop. Secondly, the lifestyle helps you to predict experience. If there's a red light, you know what the next light is going to be, and the next light after that is going to be. You have faith. You can count on the uh, light signal to behave in that kind of sequence. And third, your lifestyle helps you to control experience. If you know a red light means stop, you just don't drive through unless you want to take a chance and get killed or kill somebody. You know that it's time to stop. So the lifestyle helps you to understand experience, predict experience, and control experience. Now, that provides a certain, a certain a great degree of security. A patient feels if he acts on the basis of his lifestyle, everything will be okay. And consequently, he's going to make every effort to hang on to it. Modifying or eliminating convictions and lifestyles is generally not an easy task unless the patient has an immediate conversion experience. An immediate conversion experience to people who, like me, don't like big words is the kind of thing that happens when a kid crawling on the floor sticks his hand or his finger into an electric light outlet. He only needs one exposure to change his mind. He doesn't have to say, well, you know, practice makes perfect. It makes a par in this kind of instance, makes a perfect dunce. So, unless a person has an immediate experience, conversion experience, like St. Paul did, for example, basically, he's not going to easily relinquish or modify his behavior or his way of viewing things or his beliefs. Consequently, as I said earlier today, you find resistance in every therapy. You're trying to convert him in some way or another, and he says, no. My religion, my beliefs are true. I ain't giving him up just because you want to believe what you want to believe. You believe what you want to believe, but I believe what I want to believe. My lifestyle, they may not use these words, my lifestyle tells me so. So, every psychotherapy is an ideological conversion experience. You try to change the person's, the German word is Weltanschauung, his way of looking and experiencing life and that kind of thing. There's no comparable translation in English. So, even if you help the patient to modify, he relapses, he regresses at times because he has a feeling that the old faith was at least as good as the new faith and he's still deciding should he hang out with one or should he hang out with the other faith experience. And it's not an easy decision for patients to make unless there's a sudden conversion experience that I talked about. Uh, you're going to work very hard. It's called technically overcoming resistance. Now, immediate conversion experiences happen in and out of therapy. Let me give you the shortest therapy I ever did, maybe about 10 minutes worth. This woman came in, and the minute we closed my door, she began to sob. She never stopped sobbing any time 
during the few minutes I saw her. She told me she was a Depression era child and didn't have this and didn't have that, etc., and played the poor, uh, the poor me scenario. And then, without my asking for an early recollection, she gave me one. And the recollection went. <laughs> Remember, this was the Depression. And she grew up probably in the 1930s, 1930s. The girls are hanging out. And somebody gets the bright idea, let's go home and ask our mothers for two cents so we can go to the candy store and get candy. So all the girls go home and they ask their mothers for two cents to go get candy. And my patient is greeted with, no, it's frivolous, your teeth will rot. And her most vivid part of the memory is standing on the corner watching all the other girls, all the other girls, receding into the candy store to get candy. And now she be, really begins turning on the sobs. And she says, two goddamn cents! Two goddamn cents! And I reached into my pocket and I took out two pennies and I put them in her hand and closed her fist around it and I said, now that you've caught up with the rest of us, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? <laughs> I told you I was a crazy therapist. <laughs> and she got out of her chair, and I thought, oh God. I really put my foot in it this time. And she came over to me, and she stopped sobbing. She kissed me, and she said, you know, I don't think I'm going to need you. <laughs> Shortest therapy I ever did. <laughs> so, at any rate, uh, there are some, and they warm your heart because you don't have to work hard and you collect the fee besides. But most therapy does not go that easily. Now, you have to come up with all kinds of selling techniques, and I'll give you one or two. I tell people who just hang on tightly to their convictions and they're not going to listen to anything. I tell them that, zero, uh, that therapy, unlike other games, is not a zero-sum game. In a zero-sum game, for those of you who are not aware of game theory, <laughs> a link which I could have tied you in with earlier today. If you win, I lose. If I win, you lose. The sum is zero. If I win by six points, you lose by six points, etc. It's zero sum. I tell them therapy is not a zero sum game. You see, I tell them if I win, you win. But if you win, you lose. So why don't you throw the game to me? <laughs> and some decide to at least consider some of the things that I'm trying to sell. But in selling them anything, you have to sell them on this notion, and that is that what he's getting is better than what he'll have if he doesn't change in therapy. So sometimes I play with the patient the future 
autobiography game. I'd like you to close your eyes and envisage your life five years from now or ten years from now, depending on the patient's dynamics. What's it like? And the answer with patients like this is usually pretty dismal. I'll be the single guy that I always was, uh, etc. I'll be your next therapist. Uh, I'll have another therapist after you and that kind of thing. Incidentally, I was honored by being the 21st therapist of a patient of mine not too long ago. And uh, uh, I was, the, she was an expert on therapists, and she knew that I was the best therapist that was ever created. But she was a borderline personality, and the next she was looking to take my license and sue me in court and all kinds of things uh, because she imagined that I favored another patient over her. And uh, one of my colleagues became her 22nd therapist. <laughs> and another one of my colleagues became her 23rd therapist. And I don't know what number she's up to. But she's not buying except temporarily. And she's buying on her terms. Namely, I don't care what you have in the store. I'm telling you what I want. And if you haven't got it, I still want it. So. We have all kinds of things that we do, and we try to get patients to convert. And for those of you who've not done much therapy, we don't expect most people to engage in a whole rebuilt, uh, rehabilitative process. If you're going to do that, it will take 20 years, and you'll still have some left. But basically, nobody graduates from therapy with a halo and wings. Even if you buy another lifestyle and change your mind about your convictions, It's another apperceptive bias. It's still your way of looking at the world. And every lifestyle, barring none, has what Adler called, and I hate the term, basic mistakes. So you say, why change it all? And Adler gives the answer. He says, in therapy, we don't try to turn the patient inside out. What we try to do is replace large errors with smaller ones. So the patient is not going to turn out perfect, but he will be able to live a comfortable life here and there. Like all human beings, he'll fail at something, including proper thinking, but at least he will not be doing this as a career move because the lifestyle, unless it changes, is a career move. That's what you're going to live with the rest of your life until you die, unless therapy or some accident uh, outside of therapy permits you or helps you to change your lifestyle convictions. So, while I've been using business terms, in a certain sense, I've been using religious terms, I've been using the terms related to faith. And I first got this idea when I discovered reading Freud, that I was, in his terms, a secular priest. a non-religious priest who helps people to convert to new ideas. And you can find something I wrote in Jeffrey Zeig's book describing 
what therapy is all about. And they have Freudians and Jungians and Rogerians and Gestalt people talking about that. And they decided I was not an Adlerian. They have chapters by, I think, two or three Adlerians. Me, they put in the section of the book called Psychodynamic Therapy. Even though Jeffrey Sigh know very definitely that I was an Adlerian. So, I'm a secular priest, I'm told, and in a certain sense, that is quite true. Next, we try to enhance faith in self. You know, many of our patients feel they can't this and they can't that, they're inferior, they never did this, they were never asked to do this, they were spoiled kids, uh, all kinds of things. And uh, you give them evidence that they are this thing or things that they say, but they don't buy, they know better. And I tell them that faith in self has nothing to do with evidence. Because if you add up all your positives and all your negatives, if you're a confident person, you'll find that your uh, positives exceed your negatives. And if you're a self-defeater and depressed and discouraged kind of person, then the other thing will be true, namely that the negative things will exceed the positive things. So faith in self does not depend on positive and negative things. It depends on the view you take of yourself. So let me give you an example. Let's assume for a moment that your head is divided into two parts. And this part has memories and thoughts of all the good things you are, all the positive things you do, and all of your successes in life, how will you feel? And they say, well, I'd feel, uh, and I use it, uh, TA terms, okay. Now, supposing this side of the head contained memories and thoughts about your failures and the things that you did wrong or bad or inadequately, etc., what would you feel? Well, I'd feel not okay. So basically, what you feel about yourself depends on what you look at. If you decide to view only the positives, your successes, the wonderful things you've done, etc., you won't have these defeatist feelings that you have. And if you look at this side of your head and think only of the negative things, you're going to come up with a I'm not okay feeling, and you'll act like a not okay person. So what's your choice? What do you want to focus on? The good things about you or the bad things about you? And I say, I know that there are many inadequacies about me. I know I've had many failures in life, etc. But knowing that, I prefer it all the nice things I do and have done and will perhaps yet do and all of that. And that's why I have a cheery feeling and I feel relatively successful and I don't succumb to these kinds of I'm no good feelings that you're succumbing to. And it's my choice just as it's your choice. And I choose to do that because first of all, it's easier on me. And I, when I think that way, I behave like a much better person than I do when I think the other. So it's your choice. It has nothing to do with evidence. What do you want to look at? Another I've already told you about, the ten finger technique, which I discussed in my earlier paper today. 
then there's one that Adler talked about. He got it from Hans Wenger, but he never expanded on any technique for using it. Wenger said, and Adler subscribed to the notion, we go through the world as if, as if whatever we decide we're going to do. But he missed a wonderful opportunity to come up with a method of getting people to come out of their bad convictions and move to the good convictions. So, Dreikers told me, not directly, did it with a patient, or many patients, and that is to act as if. So, a patient would come in and say, uh, I'm a weakling, I'm a coward, or in terms of masculine protest, I'm not manly enough, or whatever. And Draggers would tell him a story, and it is an actual piece of literature that's by Max Beerbohm, a British novelist. And it's a story of a town in Hungary in which there lived a man who was terribly ugly. When people saw him coming, they crossed the street because they couldn't bear to look at his face. And he had almost no friends, and he lived his life as an isolate and that kind of thing. But he did have one very, very good friend. And one day he poured out his heart to his friend and said, why did God curse me, making me this ugly? Okay, I don't have to be the most handsome person on earth, but why this ugly that people cross the street when they see me coming? And his friend said, it doesn't have to be. And the ugly man said, what do you mean it doesn't have to be? Take a look at me. He said, it doesn't have to be. Because across the river, in the village there, there is a mask maker who makes masks that are so realistic you can't tell them from real skin. So why don't we go across the river and see the mask maker, have him whip up a mask for you, and then you'll come to town as a stranger and nobody will know who you are and how you look. And they'll only have the evidence of their eyes again. So, he wasn't going to do it. And here we repeat to the patient all the things that he's told us previously. <coughs> it won't work. What good will it do? I will know what's underneath the mask and all kinds of stuff like that, which you have to shoot down. So you repeat him again and shoot him down a second time. And finally, the patient conceded uh, the uh, man conceded and went across the river with his friend. He was fitted for a mask and by golly, it felt, it looked like real skin. And encouraged, he came back to his own village and everybody wondered who this new handsome stranger was in town. And mothers brought their eligible daughters to meet him all kinds of stuff like that and he was having the time of his life he had never imagined that life could be that much fun and finally he met a gal and he fell in love with her but of course he could not ask her to marry him because he knew what was under the mask so it got hot and heavy and one day she said let's get married and he came up with a thousand reasons or as patients like to say, good reasons why, he, why, well, you're not going to let go of your lifestyle easily. They got to be good reasons. And he came up with a thousand reasons why he could not marry her. And she shot down every single one of them. And she said, I just can't understand you. You're in love with me. I'm in love with you. We can't bear to be apart, and yet you won't marry me. And finally, having run out of excuses, he said, there's one thing about me which you don't know, and if you knew it, you 
wouldn't even consider marrying me. She says, you're nuts. I know everything about you I need to know. I just can't understand. He said, okay, I guess I'll have to tell you. And he ripped off his mask and said, okay. Now, do you still want to marry me? And she said, why not? And he said, looking like this? And she said, looking like what? And he turned and he looked in, his, in the mirror. And you know what? He looked right. just like his mask. Right. And that could just happen to you. <laughs> So, I can't give you all the techniques we use to make a dent in patients' convictions, but creative therapists know some of these or invent some of these techniques to break resistance. Thank you. Decades ago, were taught up here by a Chicagoan named Howard Pollock. And Howard was uh, a dean at our school in Chicago, but he was also the chief at the hospital where he worked. And uh, he had a group therapy group. And he felt that the group was getting stale. They were talking about how the Cubs were doing and, you know, that kind of stuff, not therapeutic stuff. So he called me and he said, Harold, something's going on in my group, I don't know what. So would you come to the next group therapy session? And just as an observer, and afterwards we'll talk and you'll tell me what you viewed and why therapy is becoming stagnant. So I agreed to come and I sat just outside the fringe of the group and I let them know, or Howard let them know, that I wasn't going to participate. And at that session, a man said, I got a problem I got to talk about. I have a psychotic girl living with me and that's not my problem. I'm quite willing to care for her, put up with her, etc. It's not easy, but I'm quite willing to do it. But she has a habit. When things goes ro go wrong for her, she gets a razor blade and cuts her wrist, and then you'd have to call the police and get her to the hospital, and then sewing her up, and all kinds of stuff like that. And I've had to put up with this several times. And our relationship for several years has been platonic. But about a month ago, she asked to have sex. Well, I didn't think of her that way, but I was willing to have sex with her. So we got into bed, and for the first time in my life, I couldn't get an erection. When I failed to get an erection, she ran into the bathroom and got a razor blade. And I panicked because I didn't know whether she was going to use it on herself or me. <laughs> she used it on herself. He called the police. They took her to the hospital. They sewed her up, etc. They did whatever it is they're going to do. And now 
within the week that is before the next group therapy session, she's going to be released from the hospital. And uh, she's going to suggest sex. Of course, he had no evidence that that would occur, but she might. And I won't be able to function again. And then I'll have to go through the slashing of the wrist, uh, etc. So he asked the group, so what do I do? And the other said, you drop this crazy lady. It's not your responsibility. He said, no, I can't do that. That much I do care for her. I care what happens to her. Well, you must be a latent homosexual. This is a group trying to help him. <laughs> so now instead of one problem, he got two problems. That's great help. <laughs> so the group kicks that around a bit, and they decide he, that he's not a latent homosexual. And uh, they come up with many more such explanations. And now I know that the guy's going to have a very, very bad week listening to all these. And I'm debating, should I intervene and spare him the bad week? Or have him come as an observer? Do I just sit there and look whatever happens, happens? Well, I decided to care. <laughs> so I didn't know what I was going to do. Didn't have the faintest idea. And I said, would you like me to help you? He said, yes. I said, I'm willing to help you if you will do exactly what I tell you to do. And I didn't know what that was at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that I didn't have 20 years to do it five times a week. So he said, I'll do anything. I don't want this problem. So I started off, and I said, have you ever seen two dogs doing it? He says, sure, lots of times. Have you ever seen a male dog who failed? Nobody in the group had ever seen a male dog who failed. <laughs> well, why is it male dogs always succeed, and male humans sometimes don't? And now the group had something to ponder. And finally, after discussing it for a, a while, one of the patients concluded, a dog knows what he has to do and doesn't. He doesn't worry how long it is and how long it takes. So I said, OK, now I'm ready to help you. But you must do exactly as I tell you. When she comes out of the hospital, and ask to go to bed with you. Before you do anything else, I want you to close your eyes and smile. And in your head, not out loud, say the words, bow wow. <laughs> Basically, that was the end of the session. <laughs> now, he came back the following week, and, which I did not attend, and Howard called me. I said, well, Howard, how did it go? And he said, the guy came in, and everybody expectantly listened to how it went. And he smiled at everybody and said, I bow out. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you are creative and know your business, you may not the first time, but somehow or other, you'll land on something that will help the patient change his mind about his lifestyle quickly. It doesn't take the rest of the person's life and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in therapy costs to help a person change his life. Next, there's the therapist's faith in himself. <coughs> Novices especially are worried about that. Some don't even know enough to 
or have courage enough to shake the patient's hand because the patient might become psychotic or aggressive. Who knows what terrible things will happen if this. In 70 years, I've done all kinds of things, some of them what I call crazy. I've never had a patient commit suicide because of it. I've never had, had them go into psychosis because of it. Some patients have liked what I've done at times, and some have not liked what I've done at times, but that's the cross every therapist has to bear, etc. And if you're a novice, use what you know. You don't have to get a brain surgeon to put a band-aid around a cut finger. Lots of people can do it who have no training or very, very little training. And if you have very little training, then get yourself the kinds of patients who require a little trained therapist. You'll benefit them probably. And probably not do harm to them. That doesn't mean to do anything crazy in literal terms. That's not a license. But other than that, to have some confidence in yourself, to let your teachers know, at least in your mind, that they didn't waste their time with you. Next, as Drikers told me and Bernie Shulman, always stay in supervision. No therapist is perfect, no therapist knows it all. And always have somebody, no matter how gifted you are, who you can bounce some idea off of and get another read on it. And Drikers, at the end of his life, told Shulman and me, I will never work alone ever. You boys, meaning children and me, we were boys at one time. You boys keep me honest. So I heartily recommend that you always have somebody you can talk it over with. And there are some things I learned along the way that helped me have confidence in myself and helped me do better therapy. The first is, I don't know, always know what to do. But I always know that there is something that can be done. Maybe not by me, maybe the patient needs somebody else other than me. But I always know that there's something that can be done. Consequently, I don't sit around second-guessing myself and, gee, I did terrible, I did this, and the patient didn't respond or responded in the way I didn't like, or some such thing like that. And uh, I can go confidently along doing problem-solving with the patient. Okay, this is what the patient is doing. Now, if it's good, how can I reinforce it? If it ain't good, how can I move the patient along to some other idea that might be better for him in the long run? So that's one thing that gives me confidence. But then other therapists especially will ask me when we discuss a case, Dr. Mozak, what's your prognosis? I have a very simple prognosis. It applies to everybody. Everybody in the world, bar none, bar none, can be better than he is this minute. Now, it may not be major, after all, there are people with IQs of 23, and, but even they can be better than they are right now. And consequently, my job is not to look at me and what goes on in my head and that kind of thing but to do some problem solving. And as I told people, I used to be a mathematician and I've tried to figure out what it is that will do uh, something to solve the patient's problem and help him to be better than he is now. But everybody can be better than he is right now. And this was 
epitomized by Carl Rogers, who operated the same way. He felt that in every person there are growth forces like in plants that make them want to grow. And you've got to provide the water and maybe a little horse manure at times or cow manure. But at any rate, you have to find out what will make him grow or help him to grow. So you are not in therapy to solve your problems. You're there to help the patient solve his problems. So it's not that I'm in a hurry to get off. It's just that I want to get everything said that I want to say. Oh my, quick. Okay, let's move to hope. The enhancing of hope plays an important role in psychotherapy. People enter psychotherapy with various degrees of no hope, ranging from complete hope to no hope. We hear people telling us, I just know I'm going to overcome this. And we have other people uh, who uh, tell us that uh, uh, there's just no hope for them. They've tried six therapists already and not one of them has gotten to them. So they play the game of I dare you with the therapist. And the first ones that tell you I've seen six therapists and nobody's been able to help show what I call scalp collectors. <laughs> Then you have, in addition to the people who are depressed and that kind of thing, people who are sinners. Some of them have no hope because they've committed the uh, unpardonable sin. I rarely find a patient who knows what the unpardonable sin is, but they know they've done it. And it's rather interesting, we get this most from Catholics, where it's an important part of their theology. And even they don't know it. And sometimes, again, I have to teach them what the unpardonable sin is, so that they'll know that they haven't committed the unpardonable sin, even if they've committed it, a sin. Suicidal patients lament that all hope is gone. But that only raises the question, why are they calling to make an appointment? Or why are they calling you before making an attempt? If there's no hope, they might just as well kill themselves if they're intent on killing themselves. Why call your therapist? He has to have a previous announcement. So even in the people who say they have no hope, they have some residual hope and we have to drag that out and really water it good. Hope contrasts with faith in several ways. Faith is generally present oriented. I believe in this, I count on this, etc. Hope is future oriented. Faith implies certainty. If I have faith in something, I know with a surety that it is so. It's something that we count on. Hope, <coughs> in contrast, focuses on possibilities and probabilities. And sometimes it includes an if-only statement. You know, if only I could get a job, I'd start being depressed or something like that. And these probabilities and possibilities are what lay people generally call the law of averages. You know, something got to work sometimes. Uh, but uh, uh, we may, 
our job is to instill hope, and we may do it with the usual things we do in therapy, namely interpret, reflect feelings, and uh, that kind of thing. But there are also techniques for encouragement people in daily life, in education, in psychotherapy. And it is not sometimes difficult to do without theory, but just a matter of technique. I was seeing a patient. I need not bother you with his problems. But he had a son who at age 10 had a generally fatal disease, was treated for years until he went into remission. The son was 10 years old when it started, didn't end until 14 or 15. And they said, you're in remission. And he lived fairly well for a couple of years. And then he thought, and it happened to be erroneous, not his error, but the therapist's error, a medical therapist. They told him it had come back and he would very likely die of it. So the kid became depressed. He stopped going to school, stopped hanging out with friends, and would take the family car out at two o'clock in the morning and drive it at 100 miles an hour uh, in a rural area, hoping that somehow or other he'd wind up dead because he didn't have the courage to kill himself actively. And his father began to weep and said, I can't bear looking at my son suffering this way. Isn't there something we could do? And I said, well, you might try therapy with him. Maybe a good therapist can help him. He said, no, he may be dead before that. We have to have something that works quickly. It was about this time of the year, and I said, you getting your son a Christmas present? Why, of course, I always get my son a Christmas present. Well, let me pick out the Christmas present this year. He said, what? I said, buy him a 10 years U.S. savings bond. And that stopped the behavior. So, sometimes regular psychotherapy, sometimes a simple creative technique can do the job for you. A therapist ought to be confident enough not to mimic the cartoon therapist who responds to his patient with, I think I can help you with your problem, but then who am I to say? <laughs> in my experience, and probably in yours if you do therapy, no discouraged therapy has ever helped a discouraged patient. So it's important that even if the patient is discouraged, you be the one not to be discouraged by the patient or by what's happening in therapy. So when I get a question, uh, when I get a patient who uh, actively keeps the notion that this goes wrong, that goes wrong, and everything I try goes wrong or will go wrong, and that kind of thing. I usually ask him, do you have an emergency plan just in case something goes right? <laughs> As a therapist, you must keep faith in yourself. That doesn't mean you can do all the things that other therapists do, but you know what? There are other things that other patients, other therapists can do, can do, that you can do. So, I'm a fan of humor. I've written a book on humor and psychotherapy called Ha 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 and Ha Ha. And 
my students say, well, we don't know any jokes that you can tell patients. And I say, well, if you were to mind to do this, I dictated 150 therapy jokes at the end of the book, just in case you don't know any of your own. <laughs> oh, but I don't know the punchline, and I stated it badly, and all of that kind of thing. And if you don't know how to deliver a joke, it's okay. It's just not your style. There are so many other techniques you can use outside of humor. I tell my students the joke of the man who went to prison. And the first night sitting down at the evening meal, somebody yelled out, 32, and everybody laughed. And somebody yelled out, 89, and everybody laughed. And somebody yelled out, 74, and people laughed. And the new prisoner asked the man that's sitting next to him, what's all this number calling? And he says, well, it's like this. The prison library only has one joke book. Everybody who's been here any length of time <laughs> <laughs> knows all the jokes. And they're numbered. So you don't even have to tell the joke. All you have to do is call the number. Everybody knows what the joke is. You like it, you laugh. So he decided, you know, when Lorenz talk about belongingness, he decided he wanted to be one of the boys. So right after dinner, he hustled over to the uh, library, got out the joke book, and memorized a few jokes that he thought were funny. And the following morning at breakfast, somebody started with 43 gales of laughter. Somebody yelled 22, more gales of laughter. Somebody yelled out 98, more gales of laughter. And the new prisoner said 19. And there was dead silence. <laughs> and he turned to the man sitting next to him and he said, how come nobody laughed? I thought 19 was a great joke. And the old prisoner said, it is. But then some people know how to tell a joke and some don't. <laughs> so if you don't know how to tell a joke, do something else. <laughs> and that's true of any other technique. But, as with other things, there are simple ways of increasing the patient's hope. Some of you may know the name of Joseph Wolby, a psychiatrist, a behaviorist. And he made one of the first tapes of doing therapy, behavioristic style. And the patient's name, not really the name on the tape, is Mrs. Schmidt. And Mrs. Schmidt says, Dr. Wolpe, do people like me ever get well? And he says, you know, just last week, I discharged a patient just like you. And you know what? And she inquired, what? Her symptoms were more severe. <laughs> so, just a simple statement like that can sometimes instill a degree of hope. And finally, I want to talk about love, which is a better translation of the uh, earlier word for love. It was charity. And I presume, although I don't know if any of you is a linguistic scholar, you may be able to edify me, but uh, I believe it is based on caritas, which is Greek for love, uh, non-romantic love. Eros is the name for romantic love. And this one, I was greatly influenced by Carl Rogers. He used a different term for it, but except to acquaint you with the term, I don't care that you use it. He 
He said, with every patient, you must have unconditional positive regard. No matter who he is, what he's done, you have to see him as a fellow human being who has problems, who creates problems, but nevertheless he's a fellow human being and he must be treated as so. What Rogers, if you see a movie of Rogers treating a patient, he is listening so attentively it looks like every fiber of his body is tuned in on the patient. There's not a world outside of him and the patient. And having spent four years with Rogers and his group, etc., I got to have much contact with Rogers. And you could hardly find a more caring person. And it's rather interesting. In one of his books, he gives his theory of personality. And basically, it is the Adlerian theory of personality. You'll hardly find very much difference in theory between Rogers and Adler. The difference, of course, is Adler was a directive therapist, a very directive therapist. And Rogers was a non-directive therapist. So Adler spoke of cooperation, therapy being a cooperative enterprise between therapist and patient. And Rogers felt that the onus for therapy lay not with the therapist, but with the with the patient or client as he called them and the client could choose to talk about what he wanted to talk about how he wanted to talk about it without fear of being tossed out of therapy fear of censure fear of judgment or any of those negative appraisals so <coughs> we must show the patient that we care and we don't teach students to care. We teach them how to interview, we teach them how to interpret, as if interpretation was all there is, and we don't teach them how to care. And if you care, you add a very, very important dimension to your psychotherapy. I know I'm running over time, and I want to leave some time for questions. So I'll just tell you a caring story. I had a patient. She was Dreykus' first patient in the United States. And since we operated in multiple psychotherapy, Dreykus and I saw her and we relieved her of a good number of things. Her obsessive compulsive personality disorder, her alcoholism, her shoplifting, uh, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, she knew, but she didn't care that she was going to hell. That did not disturb her at all. She felt she had earned a place there and she intended to keep her appointment there. But we did not see her for maybe 20, 25 years after that. And then she called and made an appointment. And her husband had just died. And she had married him after we got through doing therapy the first time. And now she was concerned, not about living, but about dying. And she did not have a single living relative. And this nice old lady of 75 was troubled. She loved to travel. And she said, what if I'm in Mexico or Athens and I drop dead on the street? Nobody will know what to do with the body. 
so. I gave her my business card and I wrote on the back of it, uh, if in danger, please call this number and lift my name. And I told her, you keep it in your purse and when you travel, since people do die, you know that, then they'll find this card on you and they'll call me and I'll make arrangements for whatever. And she didn't want to die alone, but she didn't have a relative. So she said, I'm not afraid of dying, but I don't want to die alone. So I'm depressed. I said, no need for you to be, be, to be depressed. <clears throat> wherever you are in the world and wherever I'm in the world, if I get that phone call, I'll come and hold your hand while you die. And after that, she was relieved. and She would call me every couple of months, Dr. Mosak, you remember your promise? And I would say, yes, I remember <laughs> my promise. And then she was good for another couple of months. And Dr. Mozak, you remember your promise? Well, some years later, maybe about five years later, I was coming home from Europe. And when I got to O'Hare in Chicago, my kids were there with the car, which was not unusual. And I thought they had come to take me and Bertie home. But they said they had not come to do that. They had come to tell me that my patient was at the naval station, her husband had been military, and she was dying. They didn't expect her to live till noon the following day, Sunday, and this was Saturday night, about seven o'clock or thereabouts. And the Catholic chaplain had come on Friday and given her the last rites to the church, etc. I said, okay, I guess that means you're going to have to catch a taxi home. So the three of them caught a taxi home, and I drove the 40 miles out to the Naval Station. And when I got into her room, she was all wired up with all kinds of apparatus. And I sat down and I held her hand. And I held her hand till about 1 o'clock in the morning. And she opened her eyes and saw me and she said, you're here, you're really here. And I said, I keep promises. So she smiled and went back into a coma. And I sat there holding her hand. And about four o'clock in the morning, she opened her eyes again. She said, I can't believe it, you're really here. And I said, yes, I'm really here. And at six o'clock, the Navy doctor came in and examined her. He said, she's probably good until noon. I said, I've just come back from Europe. I haven't slept in over 36 hours. Do I have time to go home and shower and eat and then come back and find her still alive because I got to hold her hand? And he said, she's good till noon. She's in kidney failure, but her kidneys will hold out until noon. I think you can safely, safely go home and do these things and come back. So I went home and I showered and I changed clothes and I ate. And I did it very, very quickly because I wanted to get back. But I thought, gee, I am so tired. After almost two days of no sleep and uh, Maybe I ought to call the hospital. Maybe the doctor was wrong. So I called the hospital and got the doctor and said, how is our mutual patient doing? And he said, she's sitting up having breakfast. I said, wait a minute, doctor. We're not talking about the same patient. I'm talking about so-and-so. And he said, so am I. I said, what is she doing sitting up having breakfast? You told me that her kidneys had shut down, so they turned on. <laughs> I said, is there any explanation for it? 
says, maybe God has one. I don't. She lived two more years. And then we had to go through it again. <laughs> this time she died, but I was holding her hand. So you really have to care. It's not just a matter of we exchange words or that kind of feeling. It's not a matter of we pat the other person on the back and say, gee, ain't it wonderful what you're doing? Or, gee, everything is going to be okay. You really genuinely have to care. So that's where I'm going to stop. And I'm going to leave some time for your asking of questions, should you want to do that. So, how about some questions? Yes? Uh, you give a lot of examples about kind of... Uh, being Come on forward, you're a long way from here. <laughs> you gave some examples about being creative in therapy. Uh, yeah. Use of creative techniques. Can you talk more about that, the importance of creativity in the theory and therapy? Well, I don't think that it's only important, first of all, in Adlerian therapy. I know many non Adlerians who are very, very creative. Uh, uh, I was trained with a uh, non directive therapist, and he was chief of service at a VA hospital and was doing non-directive therapy, so he could not urge, advise, encourage uh, any of those things. Uh, all he could do was reflect feeling. And he uh, had this patient who was coming out of a depression and was doing well, so well that she decided to have her husband's parents over for dinner for Thanksgiving or Christmas or something, I forget. And she was so excited about doing it and being able to do it. And she told him that she knew it was going to be a wonderful party. And she said, look at the menu that I've constructed. And looked at a menu and there was no appetizer. Now the therapist knew that the mother of the groom, uh, the husband, was as critical as she could be. And if she found something wrong, it would be just terrible. But here he couldn't urge, advise, interpret or anything. And he couldn't tell her so. That she had gotten a nice menu together, but if she didn't have an appetizer, things were going to fly at this party. It wasn't going to be the wonderful party that she assumed it was going to be. So by reflecting feeling, he tried to get her to come up with the thought all by herself. But she didn't. And finally, it was time to say goodbye. And in Rogerian therapy, you must quit on the exact moment. You don't give the patient an extra, any extra time, at least that used to be the old technique. Maybe they're more flexible these days. So she picked herself up, ready to go have this party, et cetera. And he could just not contain himself. So when she said, once more, I'm going to have the party of my life, he yelled out at her as she was walking out the door, don't forget the chopped liver. <laughs> so therapist do creative things and sometimes they don't follow the rules and you see in taking care of yourself and every therapist ought to take care of himself it's nice to have fun doing therapy not just carrying out some ritualistic speech that's your inferiority feeling speaking You ain't ever going to get rid of all my inferiority feelings, so what? 
In fact, I don't know two words of Greek, and I've not bothered one bit about it. I never lose sleep about it. I have an inferiority feeling. I don't know Greek. <laughs> so there are those of us who naturally are creative. We're just that way in terms of lifestyle. And some of us who are just plain dull. <laughs> they do what the rules say, and they will not bend the rules in any particular way. They will not extend the rules in, the, in any particular way. And they do lots of therapy. Except for one thing. Sometimes they meet the boring patient, and the boring patient appreciates it. The therapist is just like me, so I can count on them. <laughs> so, I've been a joke and storyteller ever since I was this high. And I don't know where I picked it up, but I did. And I enjoy doing it, so I still do it. And I find that I can tell a story that will make a point with the punchline that I could not easily make and the patient would not easily buy uh, if I just told him this in order to this in order to that. Let me give you an example. Uh, it appears on some memory device, a tape or disc or something. But uh, I participated in 1994 in a big psychotherapy meeting run by Jeffrey Zeig where they invite therapists from various orientations to talk about the kinds of things they do. And I talked about lifestyle as one. But another, perhaps because I wrote the book on humor, I got put on a panel on humor. The chairman of the panel was Albert Ellis. Then there was a Gestalt therapist and there was a Marxist, self-identified Marxist therapist. Now, my wife hated Albert Ellis. <laughs> and she finally walked out on him when Ansbacher asked him about his view on God because he was a member of the Illyrian Society, uh, Albert Ellis. He said, well, Todd Spocker, if you believe in that old fart, I guess it's true. That's how he spoke of God. So my wife just decided any time uh, Albert Ellis spoke, she's not going to be there. So we come back to Orlando 1994 to this therapy conference, and I'm on a panel on humor and psychotherapy. And the first guy says, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm a Marxist therapist. I never use humor. I don't know why they put me on this panel. And he used his whole seven minutes. We each got seven minutes to talk as a, uh, on a disclaimer. I shouldn't be there, etc. The Gestalt lady, a dear lady, had had some traumatic experience in her family. And she said, I'm really not interested in talking about humor. I'd rather talk about my trauma. I need more of that. So she talked about her trauma. So now came my seven minutes. And I said, they may not use their uh, humor in therapy, but I use humor in therapy. And I use humor in this way, this way, this way, this way, and this way. And I had to speak fast because seven minutes. And one of the ways that I said I use it is just what I taught you or told you a moment ago. I can, in a punchline, say it more easily and better than I can if I interpret that kind of thing. So I said, 
If Albert Ellis were my patient, and he's chairman of the panel, I would tell him the following story. And I thought to myself as I paused, I got to do this for my late wife. <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't do it at all, but I got to do it for my late wife. I said, if Albert Ellis were my patient, and people began to laugh, you know, me treating Albert Ellis, and in addition to that, laughing because if anybody does need treatment, it's Albert Ellis. <laughs> they had their individual views. Neither of those was mine. And I said, I, want to, I would tell him a story I first heard when I was an aviation cadet in 1944. And it's the story of two cadets who wake up in the barracks on a Sunday morning and they start uh, talking about their exploits of the night before, Saturday night. And one says to the other, did you have a good time? He says, boy, did I have one fucking time. He says, what did you do? He said, five o'clock came around. I got out of my fucking fatigues and got into my fucking class A's. And I walked down the fucking road to the gate, and there was a fucking bus waiting for me. So I got on the bus, and we went to town. I got off at the last fucking stop. And there was this gal there standing there, and she said, hey, soldier, would you like a little fun? Well, you know me, I would like a little fun. So she takes me up to her fucking room. And she turns the lights down low. And she takes off all of her clothes. And the other guy, the listener, says, yeah, 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 w what happened then? He says, what do you think happened? We had sexual intercourse. <laughs> but that was the way Albert Ellis talked. <laughs> He laughed so uproariously, <laughs> and the audience did too. And finally, and I didn't get to finish my seven minutes because they laughed part of the seven minutes. <sighs> he said, I want to thank so and so and so and so, the first two speakers, and especially Dr. Bozak. But I want to reassure Dr. Bozak and the audience that I never use fuck more than three times in any sentence. <laughs> but, you know, in my life experience, I've picked up a lot of that kind of stuff. I didn't make up the story. I heard it. And I've used it one time. That was in 1994. <laughs> So I have a full drawer in my head of stories, myths, Bible stories, <coughs> movies, etc., which help me make a point. Eddie, somebody back here? Yeah. Um, you talked about faith, hope, and love. What is your feeling about your own spirituality, about a higher power? How does that affect your you know, use some therapy and in terms of uh, your counseling or... You mean I, if I believe in a higher power well, or the patient believe, believes yeah, in a yeah, higher power? How does that work with faith, hope, and love and spirituality? And yeah, but I'm asking who's love, who's whatever? The yeah. therapist or the patients? Both, or both, both, both. both. And, and yourself personally? Well, personally, I do not let my faith and that kind of stuff invade my therapy in any way. We're not talking about me, we're talking about the patient. So I talk about the patient with his or her faith experiences, not mine, etc. So they are not aware of uh, my attitude toward God, religion, any specific religion or whatever. But one thing they know is that I understand. I under. I understand spiritual and religious experience, 
and I demonstrated that earlier today. Were you here earlier today? And uh, uh, I've read the Old Testament, for example, maybe 80 times. I've read the New Testament six, seven, eight times. I want to know what people believe, not only in lifestyle terms, but in religious terms. As I pointed out in my 1967 or 1968 paper, uh, things of the spirit are another life task. And consequently, uh, I don't just restrict myself myself to talking about Adler's so-called three tasks, three life tasks. And uh, uh, I listen very carefully. I do not dismiss any of it, except that I feel certain views uh, are not good for the patient, in which case I'll help examine them with him. You see, and I won't tell him that his faith is a lot of baloney, but I will help him to explore. He may decide that some of this stuff is a lot of baloney, but he also may learn. Well, let me tell you, Sorry. we used to we used to have a requirement at our school that every student had to undergo therapy before graduation. And for years, we had a group of groups of priests come to study with us, and consequently, they had to undergo therapy. <laughs> and some of them decided that I was going to be their therapist, so they made appointments with me. One of them, who just died two months ago, I cared for as a human being, and I cared for because he was my patient also. But when he came, the week he came, he came down with an, an illness that required major surgery. And I'd never met the guy, but I knew he was in the hospital, and so my wife and I drove down to the hospital, and we sat with him, and we talked with him, and that kind of thing, and my wife said to him, and when you come out of the hospital, who's going to do things for you? He said, I guess I'm going to have to do them for myself. She said, that ain't going to happen. When we find out you're coming out of the hospital, you will come to our home. And you'll convalesce us there. And he did. So much so that... My kids, who were very, very young, called him Uncle whatever his name was. And he became sort of part of my family. In fact, when his mother died, he called me and he said, I knew she was going to die. I was all prepared for it, I thought. But since she died a couple of weeks ago, I can't get started. I go down to work, but I think only about her. I don't think about the work I'm doing, etc. I said to them, so-and-so, come home. He said, I'm on the one o'clock plane. So we cared for him. He knew that. In fact, after his finishing school with us, he was transferred to Houston, Texas. And whenever I taught in Houston, Texas, he explained to my wife that what cured him was her chicken soup. So she would freeze a gallon of chicken soup, and I would hope that the plane would not come light, because otherwise it was going to be all over me. Yeah. <clears throat> and then he chaired a panel at a there in a convention. And he introduced so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so. and then he said, at the far end of the table is Dr. Bozak. No person in the world has more of a right, and he was one of nine children, 
has more of a right to call himself my brother than he, you see. But I must tell you this, I had my therapy with him, and the first day he made me mad. Huh. And what made me mad was after I laid out all the things I wanted to work on, he said to me, we'll make a good Christian out of you yet. <laughs> he said, 25 years of priest, and here this Jewish therapist is going to turn me into a good Christian. But that's exactly what he did. So I bring out the best in people whether it's religious or not, if I can. And as the German Edlerians say, you have to make as a therapist yourself into nothing. It is the patient who's important. It's not a matter of you're successful or you're a failure. It's a matter of has the patient improved? So uh, that's what I do. I work with the person's faith experience or lack of experience. In turn, you learn from them. <clears throat> In turn, you learn from your patients. Uh, much I learn from my patients, not only about religion, but about all kinds of other things. Remember, I've not had the experience of every human being in the world. And sometimes people let me know things that I'd never thought of. I'd never even thought existed many times. What else? Yes. Um, I, when talking about faith, um, faith and hope and love, I'm wondering if you can kind of share any experiences you might have had with survivors of the Holocaust and your children through the years. <laughs> Strange, you ask that. I've never been asked that in a meeting. But, ac but actually, I worked on the Yale Holocaust Project. So I had encounters. And I learned things I never, never experienced, never knew anybody who experienced from interviewing all of these Holocaust survivors. And you got a week. Anything else? Okay, go have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. On the table, there's certainly an uh, opportunity for you to stay in. Hi, I'm Mary. Hi, talk to you, whatever you prefer. But uh, thank you for your attendance tonight. Appreciate it.